Hello and welcome to this special 1 million subscriber celebratory episode. Um, I actually crossed the 1 million threshold a few weeks ago, but uh, people have been emailing me for months asking me if I was going to do anything special for the occasion. And for quite a while, my standard response was simply to quote Dilbert. I will not be pressured into having fun just because we use a base 10 counting system and a big round number is coming up. But the real reason is, short of unboxing this gold YouTube play button, I honestly couldn't think of a whole lot of interesting things to tell you guys. But the last few weeks, I've actually thought of some pretty interesting things, and uh, including a very small contribution I made to a recent episode of the um, hit TV series Young Sheldon, which I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. But uh, for the moment, let's go ahead and unbox this play button. Now, before I unbox the gold one, here's some footage I took but never showed of unboxing my last silver play button for 8-bit keys. Now, honestly, when I got these silver buttons, I really thought I had reached the peak of my YouTube career because I didn't think there were more than 100 people interested in the topics that I cover. But apparently I was wrong, so uh, let's open this gold button and see what it looks like. Wow, this thing is huge! And they also included a note. <laughs> it says, uh, you're bigger than Vancouver, you're bigger than Venice, you're even bigger than Las Vegas. Well, it's pretty much a form letter, but uh, yeah, still pretty cool. But this plaque, <laughs> I really thought it was going to be smaller and that there was going to be more padding in the box. <laughs> Here we go, presented to the 8-bit guy. And I guess this just hangs right on the wall like this. Wow, so I am just about speechless. This thing is huge. I mean, it's, it's much bigger than I was anticipating. And I shouldn't be surprised because I just watched LGR unbox his um, just a few months ago. And it should be the same uh, version that I have. But... Uh, this thing is just uh, massive compared to the other plaques. It's also very heavy. It's hard to hold with one hand. Um, this thing is massive compared to my other plaques. And I'm not quite sure where I'm going to mount it. In fact, it's already irritating because uh, they changed the design between the time I got the uh, silver play button for 8-bit guy and then the silver play button for 8-bit keys. So they don't even match. And, uh, oh, and while we're at it, a lot of people have been asking me about the Planet X3 poster, but this is actually not a poster. This is, uh, I got this idea from Techmoan because he did a video on these a while back. This is actually a Planet X3 vinyl record that I have hanging up there. So uh, <laughs> anyway, so yeah, I'm going to have to figure out how to rearrange this stuff. So by the end of the episode, maybe I'll have that figured out. But in the moment, let's talk about some other stuff. Hey Clark, today's the day. It's in the back. I'll go get it. What's he getting? So what was he going to get indeed? Uh, so yeah, I've got a little story for you. Several months ago, I received this phone call early in the morning from a nice lady that worked in the prop department for the TV show Young Sheldon. And she had a question for me uh, regarding um, some vintage computer equipment. Now, of course, um, I had to agree to keep all this confidential, um, at least until the episode had aired, which now it has, so I can talk about it. Uh, so the problem was, um, Sheldon was supposed to be getting a modem, and they had found a modem to use, and I think they'd gotten it on eBay or something like that. And it was like a, it was like an old Tandy DCM3 modem, Direct Connect modem, something like that. And so the way these modems work is they're just one step above the acoustic coupler. So um, it was a direct connect modem, meaning it connected between your phone and and the wall. Um, but um, when you wanted to dial the other computer, you would have to pick up the phone and then dial the computer. And then you would have to wait to listen for the carrier tone for the other computer. And then there was this big button on the front of the modem called connect. You would push and then you would hang up the phone and then your modem would be connected. Well. And then, the, of course, the other problem was um, she had mentioned that this story is supposed to take place in the year 1990. And um, so, yeah, that modem was already pretty obsolete by the year 1990. And I had a hard time believing that Sheldon would be going into Radio Shack and buying that brand new. I mean, if like were a hand-me-down or something, I could maybe see, but not brand new. The other problem, which I think was a more serious problem, is she said that the script required that um, the modem be able to dial itself, and they wanted to have an accurate representation of that. So um, they apparently didn't have uh, the correct kind of modem to use, and so she asked me if I could find them one. 
The catch is, of course, I had to find it and get down to the FedEx office by 8 o'clock that day and get it shipped off to them priority overnight. So that didn't leave a lot of time. And I made a bunch of phone calls. And uh, um, unfortunately, I was not able to find a more appropriate modem, uh, at, you know, in the time allowed, right? I mean, because a lot of the people I was trying to contact were just not available. They were at work or, or whatever. And so... Um, but I did manage to find uh, one. Uh, my friend Kevin had uh, two of them. Actually, they were Tandy 1200 baud modems. And these uh, would be a perfect match for Sheldon's computer. And uh, the trouble was they were just absolutely filthy. And they had marker residue all over them and, um, <laughs> and stickers. And, and they were yellow. And, of course, I didn't have time to retrobrite them uh, because, you know, I had to get this shipped off with, within a matter of hours. And uh, anyway, and of course, it was a 30-minute drive over there to pick them up and a 30-minute drive back. And then by the time I got back, I only had like maybe three hours to get these things cleaned up and then get them to the FedEx office. So uh, I did take some video of the cleaning process, though. So... Uh so my plan was to clean both, and hopefully one of them would come out decent enough. This one here cleaned up well enough that it might actually pass as new at a distance, but I told them uh, they might have to spray paint the top of it. And just so you can see what it looks like powered on, and you can see the modem sitting next to Sheldon's Tandy 1000 in the episode. So yeah, I was pretty proud to be able to help out even if it was just in a small way for one of my favorite TV shows. Um, I would mention though that in the narration, uh, Sheldon actually says it's a 300 baud modem, which is actually not true. That was a 1200 baud modem that I sent them. However, uh, they might have recorded the narration long before they got my modem, in which case the modem they were going to use was in fact a 300 baud. So who knows? So at this point, I just want to take a look back at the last three years that I've been doing YouTube, which I think is a significant portion of the time because the three years has been uh, how long I've been doing YouTube full time. And I've done quite a few neat things. And uh, one of the things that I've done is I've done a lot of traveling uh, for the show. Uh, most of it was going to gaming conventions. And so I just want to show you some of the places that I've been. I've been to Austin like four times in the last three years. I've been to Orlando for two different events. I've been to Portland four times now for the Retro Gaming Expo there. Uh, Chicago for the Vintage Computer Festival. I've been to Long Island twice and Providence, Rhode Island and Oklahoma City. And looking at Europe, I've been to London with a stopover in Oslo, Norway. And earlier this year, I was in Germany. So I'll show you some of the highlights. Uh, the Retro Gaming Expo in Long Island takes place inside of an aviation museum each year, which is pretty cool. In fact, they even have a complete lunar lander there uh, left over from the Apollo missions. Maker Faire in Orlando had so many neat things uh, that people had built. But I think the most impressive of all was this DeLorean, which was modded to look exactly like the one from Back to the Future. Also at these places, I do get to meet a lot of other cool people and celebrities, but I wanted to give a shout out to one in particular, which is Warren Davis. He's the inventor of the game Cubert, and he's a really nice guy to hang out with. 
and there was actually a mix up at the free play event in Florida and they had forgotten to get me a table for signing autographs and stuff. And when Warren asked why I was just walking around aimlessly, I told him and he offered to share his table with me for the whole event. In Rhode Island, the big highlight was getting a personal tour of the Rhode Island Computer Museum. It's mostly just a warehouse, but the size and scope of what they have in that place is truly breathtaking. Last year we went to London, and when I say we, I should point out that my wife often attends these events with me at least half the time, but for London I took my wife and daughter, and uh, my wife is afraid of heights, so only my daughter joined me on the London Eye. Um, however, I have to give her some credit, here's a photo from 2007. Yeah, that's 12 years ago, and uh, we were in London back then, and she did write it at that time, but said she would never write it again. As far as writing things in London, though, the underground was actually quite an experience on its own. I mean, we, we just don't have anything like that where I'm from. Also, this was my first time to meet Parafractic in person, since he was, by sheer coincidence, also in London at the same time as us, visiting family. And um, we also made a trip to Brighton and rode on the i360, which is a pretty darn cool, and I recommend that as well. Moving along, this is the three of us in Oslo, Norway, uh, fortunately during the summertime. I got to visit Anders Jensen's little recording studio in person, and uh, this is us standing on the top of the opera house there. But one of the neatest trips I did was earlier this year when I went to Germany for the Tomon event, which I did a whole video about over on 8-Bit Keys, and I got to meet a lot of other YouTubers and other just really cool people at that event, and uh, it was especially fun meeting Sam from Look Mum No Computer, he is quite a character. I also think I shocked the world in that video when people discovered I can speak German. Uh, many people emailed to ask how I learned it, so this picture here will shed a little bit of light. Uh, this is back from my high school days, probably around 1993. I took four years of German in school and was even involved in a German exchange program. And this is me on the left in the tie-dye shirt, probably aged 18. And I'm with my exchange student in a little German town called Offenburg. So uh, that's why I can speak German. Now, like I said, most of these events are gaming conventions where I do live speeches and meet with fans, and other than the usual hassles of traveling, these are usually pretty fun, and most of the conventions are paying my travel expenses, so it doesn't cost me anything to go. And speaking of cool people, um, I often have visitors who come by and take a tour of the place, and I've shown some of these before, uh, but these are all of the visitors I've had since the last time I showed them, which was about a year ago. Um, in some of these photos you can see stuff on my workbench, which will give you an idea of which project I was filming at the time each visitor came by. And now, to finally hang that plaque. So here it is, and uh, I am very honored to have received this award from YouTube, and I'll be, I'll be completely honest, I never thought there was a million people that were actually interested in vintage computers or vintage gaming, and so uh, I, I never thought that this day would come. In fact, when I got the 100,000 plaque, um, I thought, well, that's got to be it. There can't be any more people out there. <laughs> so um, I'm actually really happy that interest in vintage computing has uh, risen the last few years, so... Um, I think that's part of it, but I also had some announcements that I wanted to make. So a lot of people have been asking me if I'm going to run out of content ideas. And uh, the answer is no. In fact, I've got um, at least a hundred different scripts uh, partially written to more than I'll probably ever be able to actually produce. And uh, in fact, one of the problems I have is that I've got certain videos I've, I've sat down and started to make four or five times and then... Now, something that will come up, some kind of time-sensitive thing where I have an opportunity to make a video, but it has to be done right now, and then I'll just have to push everything else off into the future. And so there's just some videos I've been trying to make now for a year, and I haven't been able to, to get it done. <laughs> <laughs> but those uh, hopefully uh, will be coming soon. And a lot of people have been uh, emailing me lately very concerned about my channel going away uh, because this child online protection privacy thing, whatever it's called. 
And I don't think you guys got anything to worry about. Um, first of all, my channel doesn't target kids, and none of my videos that I know of specifically target kids either. Granted, I do have some kids that watch my show, but um, 13 and under is by far not the target audience of this channel. And so I don't think I'm going to be affected by this at all. However, you know, when it goes into effect, I guess, you know, I guess we'll see. Uh, if I do end up losing 90% of my ad revenue, um, well, I still don't think the channel is going to go away. Um, I get half of my income from Patreon as it is. And I, you know, I'm not one of those channels that go around and shove Patreon in people's face. Yes, it's in my end credits, but I never really talk about it um, during my videos. Which, by the way, I'll take this opportunity to tell you that every time I release a video, it is released to Patreon first. And so there's always all these comments down in the video saying, what's wrong with YouTube? It says this video was released, you know, 24 hours ago, and yet I'm just now getting the notification. Well, that's why. So hopefully you guys will stop um, commenting about that. But um, so anyway, you know, I know a lot of channels, they'll shove uh, Patreon in your face. They'll tell you, oh, be sure to ring the little bell and, uh, you know, and for notifications and subscribe and all that kind of stuff. And, and I just, I don't do that uh, because I, I don't, I don't, I think it detracts from the quality of the videos. And I'm fairly passionate about uh, what I make. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm fairly proud of the content that I produce and I just don't want to poison it with a bunch of stuff like that. Um, but I think that if it came down to it and I lost all of my advertising revenue, I could probably, um, you know, make an appeal to my audience, please support me more on Patreon. And I think that, I think I could live off of that. So again, um, I don't think the channel is going to be going away. Oh, and the other thing while we're talking about it, is, you know, I get uh, sponsorship requests all the time. And some of them are actually like really lucrative. Like I've had some people offer as much as $20,000 sometimes to, you know, uh, stick some kind of, uh, you know, sponsored ad in the middle of my YouTube video where I talk about some person's, um, you know, whether it's their phone app or some stupid product they make or whatever. And, and I just turn them down uh, over and over and over again. And because, again, like I said, I feel like that kind of stuff detracts from the quality of the videos. And I want my videos to be kind of evergreen. You know, if somebody wants to watch a documentary about a Commodore 64, I want that video to be just as relevant 10 years from now as it is uh, when it's released. And so that's why I don't want to put any kind of permanent advertising inside my videos. But if it came down to it and I lost all my YouTube ads, then I might have to start doing some of that kind of stuff. But again, I don't think you guys got anything to worry about. I do not anticipate any changes uh, taking place for my channel. So that's, um, that's all I have to say about that. Um, another announcement is um, I, my store. I know a lot of people have been emailing me because I'm out of shirts and stuff like that. I do have plenty of Planet X2, Planet X3, but um, this year has been absolutely crazy. A lot of things have happened, personal stuff, and it's just certain parts of my business just kind of had to get you know, thrown to the side for a while and merchandise was one of them. I just have not been able to keep up with it. So sorry. Um, <laughs> hope to have that remedied maybe, uh, sometime in the next year. So another thing I want to talk about was email overload. So I know I've always said in the past that I try to answer 100% of emails that come in, but unfortunately the quantity of emails keeps getting larger and the amount of time I have to answer them keeps getting smaller. And so I still read the vast majority of emails that come in, but I just do not have time to reply to all of them. I'm still replying to like maybe 75% of them. But um, so I'm just going to apologize in, in advance if uh, you've sent me an email and I have not replied. And that may be just unfortunately the way it has to be going forward. But I'm just, just getting too many of them. And I had one more uh, little uh, thing to talk about, which is uh, people are always asking me uh, when I'm going to come to their town for an event or gaming convention or whatever, or where they can see a list. And believe it or not, I've actually had a list of scheduled events on my website for years now, but a lot of people don't know that it's there. So if you want to have a look and see like what cities or what events I'm going to be out next, uh, just, just go to the scheduled appearances section on my website. And actually right now, there's not really anything listed there because uh, all the events for this year are done. And I haven't finalized um, any of the events for the year 2020, which will be, you know, next year. So, but if you just keep checking back, I'm sure uh, over the next few months, you'll start to see some stuff pop up in there of, of uh, some of the places I'm going to be uh, next year. And hopefully I'll get to go to some new places. I've, I've been doing a lot of the same places over and over again. 
the last few years, but uh, I'm hoping this year to maybe branch out a little bit and go to some different places. So, um, but anyway, um, I guess uh, thank you everyone who's subscribed to my channel and who's been watching me for all these years and uh, helped to make this channel a success. And uh, like I said, I'm very honored to have hit the 1 million mark and um, hope to see many of you at future events as I uh, travel around and talk to people. And as always, thanks for watching.